But you set all these things on the application and they're going to go in forensically like a crime scene. They're going to come in and stop everything, put the yellow tape around everything, stop operations and go determine all that information as far as what you put on that application and what the reality was. Hey everybody, and welcome to the Incident Report presented by Quest Technology Management. I'm Paul Burke, Director of Technology Communications. Every week, I'm joined by VP of Sales and Partnerships, Adam Burke. The Incident Report brings you conversations with thought leaders, business innovators, and channel mavericks to help you stay productive and agile in a changing technology landscape. Today, our guest is Tim Burke, Quest President and Chief Executive Officer. Quest has grown from a small three-person computer media supply firm to a worldwide leader in technology management. Tim has continued his commitment to provide unparalleled customer service with a focus on quality and flexibility for over 40 years. Tim's core values for Quest remain the same, which are expressed in Quest's tagline, how can we help? Hey everybody, welcome back to the Incident Report. I'm your host, Paul Burke. Well, I'm one of your hosts, my co-host, Adam Burke, sitting across from me. Adam, how are you doing today? Good, Paul. Excited to be here. Very excited about the topic we're going to be discussing around cybersecurity insurance. Ready to dig into it. Me too, Adam. I'm excited to learn about cyber insurance. And for such a big topic we brought in, we were able to get the Quest CEO, the owner himself, Tim Burke. Tim, how are you doing today? Great, Paul. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm excited about learning more about cyber insurance. I don't know a lot about it. So let's start ground floor what is cyber insurance and what does it offer customers? That's a great question. The reason I mean it's a great question is that it means a lot of different things to different people. Cyber insurance has been around for a number of years and was focused on things like customers getting hacked, people stealing data from their systems and so forth. And if there was costs associated with fixing their systems after a breach, that's where they would utilize uh, their cyber insurance. Over the last couple of years, what it basically has been provided as a methodology for customers to be compensated if in the event they do have a breach or they do get stuck in a ransomware situation, they have an insurance company they can go to to help them with the cost of that circumstance that they find themselves in. So similar to uh, Fire insurance, there's insurance available to help compensate your costs associated with that event. You talk to a lot of companies about cyber insurance and the need for cyber insurance. What's the one thing that you wish they would understand? Like any kind of insurance, I think the understanding that is important for clients to have is really to understand what their coverage is. And prior to having to use cyber insurance, what are the things that they need to do so they don't have to utilize cyber insurance? I think some companies think, well, I've got cyber insurance, so maybe some of the issues that I should be addressing in my company, I don't really need to address because of quote unquote, I have cyber insurance. And that's not really the case. I think also a lot of companies misunderstand what their insurance covers, what it doesn't cover. And that's been hugely changing over the last couple of years. And the other item that customers really should try to understand is how is it changing from a cost standpoint? Costs are going through the roof for cyber insurance and, and a lot of customers are trying to get their head around, why is this costing me so much? What's the circumstances and how can I mitigate that? So that's a great question. Why are costs exploding? Is it the ransomware situation? Is it things like log4j? What's causing the, the drastic increase? Well, the reason for the drastic increase is pretty straightforward. Insurance companies have been paying out a lot of money for cyber insurance. So as a result of having to pay out a lot of money, they're in the business to make a profit. Most insurance companies would like to make a profit. And in cyber insurance, that's been a challenge in the last couple of years because so many companies are filing claims. So the claims are just skyrocketing. They're very expensive claims. And primarily that is around the idea of ransomware. I would say probably of every one story you hear about on the news for ransomware, there's probably 30 to 40 stories of ransomware that are happening in a community or in the nation that you're not hearing about. And the insurance companies are having to pay those bills. And as a result, they're trying to recoup some of the money they've lost, as well as cover their future expenses as best they can understand that. Does cyber insurance always cover ransomware? 
No, that's a great point. It historically always was generally and vaguely identified, but in the last couple of years, a lot of insurance carriers are specifically identifying ransomware as what you would call a rider in an insurance policy, additional coverage for your cyber insurance that many clients need to understand when they're looking at their policies as they move forward. Is ransomware covered? If not, what do I have to do to cover it? A lot of insurance companies are just trying to get out of the cyber insurance business, whether they're offering the policies in the future or not. Sometimes what they're doing is they're excluding certain things from their policies. And if you want it included, you have to know it's not included and pay more for it, it's become a much more complex situation going forward. We're seeing some costs for cyber insurance when we're working with clients. And Tim, I don't know if you're seeing this as well, or if you have anything to kind of add to it, but we're seeing people get numbers back for significantly reduced amount of coverage for almost twice to, to two and a half times their previous premiums. That's a significant cost to any business, you know, regardless of the size of its enterprise, medium or small. Are you seeing people in your circle dealing with those costs? Are they trying to improve security footprints so they don't have to necessarily deal with the larger premium or the larger coverage? How's that looking? Well, we're seeing on average two things happening. One, insurance companies just not providing the coverage any longer. So you got to make sure you've got the coverage. They just have decided we're going to get out of the business. Some take a different approach rather than just saying, no, we're not going to do it. We're just going to charge a lot for it. What you paid historically may now cost five or six times as much. I know one example where a client had a requirement. They had $10 million as an example in cyber insurance coverage. And that premium went up four and a half times from one year over the next. So in that case, the client decided to downsize their coverage to bring it more in line with what they had historically paid. So they now have lesser coverage for maybe the same amount of money or maybe just double the amount of money that they paid. The client may have a fourth of the coverage for the same amount of coverage that they paid for last year. We're seeing that as well. Customers can certainly try to potentially buy less coverage. And we are seeing some companies saying, well, we need to beef up some of our proactive approaches internally because we have less coverage. We just need to make sure we don't have to use it. That's certainly a, something that's a, a good approach. We're also seeing a lot of insurance companies. I'll give you some examples. Maybe a year ago, two years ago, the insurance, the cyber insurance application. So every year, in the insurance business and cyber insurance, you have to fill out this application. Uh, a year and a half, two years ago, it might have been a half a page, answer some questions. And then last year, maybe a, a full page of questions. We've seen applications now as long as five and six pages of questions, verifications, what kinds of things you're doing in your organization, the right on the part of the insurance company to come in and do inspections. They've become very, very diligent they have lost a lot of money in cyber insurance over the last couple of years and are trying to stem that flow. So you mentioned that they have to submit a five-page document. Do the insurance companies come in and audit before issuing the insurance? Personally, I haven't, I haven't seen that. I have heard where we've gotten on calls with insurance companies where they've asked questions of clients about different capabilities that the clients put in place. I haven't seen anybody come in and do a specific audit of those. They retain the right to do that at some point in time as they do in any kind of insurance, actually. If you have fire insurance for your business or liability insurance, I know us as a business, we have a carrier and, and they bring by a safety people to, to look at how we run our business and so forth. So they certainly have the right to do that. Some of the questions and requirements that customers are being faced with, they're, they're just not doing. Now they're having to look at all these capabilities and figure out how they can make them happen, which is an additional cost to the, the client as well as the increased cost of the insurance. Are there numerous options in the cyber insurance space or is it limited to just a handful of providers? There's fewer and fewer players. What you are seeing for customers who had maybe smaller revenues and so forth, historically insurance had been sold in what was referred to as a all-inclusive package. 
which covered a lot of different things for their business. And cyber may have been a part of that all-inclusive package. So historically, they bought it over the years and it, it had cyber, it had fire, it had liability. It was all packaged together. Now that's changed. A lot of those packages don't have it any longer. So people need to really understand whether they continue to have cyber or don't have cyber as part of their package policy. And if they don't, the number of cyber insurers is really reduced over the last couple of years, people who are willing to carry it. If you do get it, it's becoming much more expensive. And as I said, the application process has become much more onerous. I feel like this is a game of 20 questions with Tim Burke. Are there rates that are different for companies who have in-house IT versus outsourced? Actually, we've not really figured out what drives rates. It's not as clear cut as in-house outsourced. It typically, what we think is occurring is it's being based on the industry that you're in. Possibly we're thinking it's this revenue size that you are as a client for that insurance company. And they're basing some pricing on some logarithm that they've established. I don't really believe that even the application process is necessarily, though it's grown to four or five pages, I don't know if that's really impacting the answers you put on that application other than the revenue size and, and so forth. They are specifying in that application process that there's some specific requirements and they're asking specific questions about certain things that you have available in your security systems. Whether or not you answer that a certain way, if that's impacting your pricing for your policy, we haven't been able necessarily to determine if that's a factor. How do companies know if they're compliant with their current cyber insurance demands? The application is really the starting point. So that application is, here's all the things you need to be doing and you need to tell us, yes, you're doing them. So you're backed up, you have multi-factor authentication. How do you manage your firewalls? A lot of information like that. Again, I don't think that's necessarily impacting your uh, pricing. It could be, but we're not clear at this point exactly what people are getting charged and how they're getting charged, how that determination is really being derived at this point in time. I, I assume if you told them, no, we're not doing multi-factor authentication. No, we're not doing backups. No, we're not doing <laughs> firewall management, firewall monitoring and all the things that that application is talking about, my thought would be, is you're probably just not going to get insurance. They're just going to decline. It's not like, oh, okay, you're not doing anything that needs to be done. So here's your rate. I, I'm just thinking you're going to get declined. And one area of concern when you're filling those, you know, it used to be one page. Now it's, you know, five, six, 12. When you're filling those things out, one of the concerns I think like with any insurance is the accuracy of what you're filling out in the event there is an event that needs to be validated and accurate. Because if it's not, that gives the insurance provider the ability to pivot what you thought you'd get back from an interruption or from a, a liability standpoint could be significantly reduced based on, hey, you know, we said you, you said you had logging enabled. You said you had these backups in place. You said you had multi-factor authentication for your users, but it looks like according to XYZ, you only had that enabled for half your people. I mean, that could significantly impact what the coverage is and what it actually turns out to be after the adjusters take a look at things. Yeah, that's correct. One of the things that insurance companies are really focused on these days, which is something businesses really need to understand too. If you're gonna pile a claim, they're going to stop everything in its tracks as far as you getting back operational in business and they're going to show up there with their forensic people to understand exactly what happened they're going to find out whether you really had immutable storage whether you really had backups whether you really had multi-factor authentication did you have endpoint protection that you said on the application you had what's called next gen endpoint protection you said all these things on the application and they're going to go in forensically, like a crime scene. They're going to come in and stop everything, put the yellow tape around everything, stop operations, and go determine all that information as far as what you put on that application and what the reality was. And then as part of that forensic, try to understand, well, what happened here? 
Someone opened a bad email. Well, you said you had email protection of some sort to catch that stuff. You had endpoint protection. Why did that not work? The key there is your company in this forensic process may be shut down for as long as a week to two weeks as this forensic process goes on. And they're not going to let you start running things again until they have defined what the circumstances are. That's something a lot of business owners aren't necessarily thinking about as they acquire cyber insurance. But the reality is that's radically changed these days as far as how they're going to enter into those circumstances. I'm sure we've experienced that where we get involved in a potentially helping someone who comes to us in the middle of an incident and they kind of have to make a decision. Do you recover and get the business back operational? Or are you putting the crime scene tape up and locking everything down? That's a business decision that I'm sure we've been a part of a few times. Yeah, we have. And again, that is a business decision and, and their insurance companies become the folks that are calling those shots oftentimes. And if you're going to want to collect on your cyber insurance, you're going to probably with your attorneys, uh, with your IT organizations and so forth, have to work with the insurance companies to understand what their processes are and how forensically they need to do what they need to do, because that is a big issue today. And one thing that's not really talked about in the idea of cyber insurance is in the idea of disaster recovery. So disaster recovery, we always think of fires and floods and things like that. And how do I recover if I have to move somewhere else and, and so forth? And we all hope those things don't happen, but the same holds true in cyber and cyber events and specifically with an insurance company who needs to come in and close down the operation for a week to two weeks while they forensically figure out things. That's something that you need to really factor in from a DR standpoint and from a disaster recovery and truly define a disaster recovery plan for a cyber event. And most companies don't typically have that. And the insurance company, they're not really asking about it because their idea is if you're going to make a claim, we're shutting you down and we're going to do forensics. And as soon as we get the forensics figured out, you can start figuring out how to bring your company back operational. And Tim, I'm curious, and I'm sure the audience is curious as well. How does a business plan for ransomware disaster recovery situations? If it does happen, what are key things that businesses should have in place in regards to business continuity while undergoing a forensic investigation? Yeah, good question from a, from a DR standpoint. Not something that's talked about a lot in the DR space at this point in time. It's starting to be talked about more. Assume you have been impacted in any DR circumstance. Assume that you have been impacted, in this case, by a cyber attack. How do I fully operate? Because what's going to happen at the point in time that I am impacted by a cyber attack, then you need to understand, you need to pre-handle, you need to have gone to your insurance company and said, hey, if something happens, how am I going to get impacted here? Are you going to shut me down for a week while you figure it out? Or what are the circumstances? And you need to, in essence, what we call tabletop that process to understand what that looks like for you as it relates to a cyber event. And then you need to plan accordingly. So if your insurance company might say, no, 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 we're going to let you rebuild or no, 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 no. If it's a ransomware thing, we're probably just going to pay the ransom and go on our way. If that works out, we're all fine. This is what the process is going to be. So your insurance carrier, you need to be in touch with them about that cyber event and then truly understand how that impacts your operations. And then you need to plan accordingly. From a DR standpoint, do I have a copy, a mutable copy, fancy word immutable for, a, you know, it's, it's locked down my overall systems and my operations so I can recreate it quickly. So again, I need to walk through all of those processes, putting in place the realities that you're going to face as it relates to your legal team, your IT operational team as well as your partner from a cyber insurance standpoint, because they all have processes. And if you go to your insurance carrier and ask those questions, that will do nothing but help you with your insurance carrier. They'll be very impressed that you're thinking through that because they usually in the cyber insurance space is what they call business continuation insurance. 
which pays for you to be out of business and they want to get you operational as quickly as possible while at the same time doing forensics. So if you're working with them in that regard, putting that plan together, uh, they would be very, uh, very impressed by that. I'm also wondering what can a company do to make sure they are in compliance? Are there checkpoints available? That's a great question. There's always an opportunity to consistently approve and evaluate. We help customers give them a good understanding where we'll approach the IT team. If they have a compliance team, if they have a risk management, we help them identify, you know, potential gaps, areas where they might want to take a look or relook at things. Things are changing so fast. Insurance requirements are updating. People are dealing with these new questionnaires. We help organizations evaluate those changes and make sure that they're proactively addressing them. There's so many things going on right now, especially in the SMB and mid-market space. IT teams can get overwhelmed with all the changes. Take a proactive approach, constantly communicating your current risks. And what we've been able to do is work alongside the IT teams to communicate leadership so they can make a business decision. One of the services we offer at Quest is cybersecurity discovery sessions. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Again, based on the client's uh, circumstances, they're working with their IT teams. We've worked with a lot of clients and collaborate on the idea of where do you have gaps? What are your requirements? Maybe on this five page application that the insurance company has sent to you using that as possibly a template, we can work through with clients and understand what their current circumstances are and what their gap is not only for the insurance purposes, but for just general operational considerations. We have also a lot of government agencies who are imposing a lot of new requirements on many of our clients. And we work with them as well as identifying any gaps that they may have that they could address. Really helpful things for any organization to consider. Again, thank you so much, Tim, for joining us today and sharing a little bit more about cyber insurance. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Very much enjoyed it. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks, everyone. That was a great conversation. Thanks so much for listening. The Incident Report is brought to you by Quest Technology Management. Quest team will be attending Channel Partners Conference and Expo in Las Vegas on April 11th through the 14th. And we still have opportunities for you to grab a spot on our calendars. We are looking forward to discussing partner alignment opportunities, including joint business strategies and how Quest can help you grow your book of business. Schedule your appointment with the co-host of the Incident Report and VP of Partnerships, Adam Burke, Quest National Partner Manager, Gary Schick, or VP of Marketing, Darcy Baker. Links are in the episode description. With over 40 years of experience, Quest is a leading technology integrator working seamlessly with your staff and systems to achieve your IT goals. Learn more about everything they do at questsys.com. And if you have questions or suggestions for the podcast, you can always email Adam and myself at the incident report at questsys.com. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.